I was also originally from Bay Area. I worked at uh, Stanford University uh, for my 10 years before I moved to UT Austin. And the primary reason of that move is that uh, I really want to be neighbor of David. And he told me that he moved to Austin. <laughs> and, and tell you about this uh, industry of uh, lithium ion batteries. And I will uh, review what we are doing as the uh, players in the academia, and we, I will talk about how we integrate our efforts and communicate and collaborate with the industry. And finally, I would like to highlight that, how can we leverage the developments in AI to really make this industry more effective? So, we all have a better in your pocket, because that's the reason that you can move along with your uh, um, cell phones. But not everybody knows what the battery is like inside. Here I give you some uh, schematic, uh, schematic drawing. Yeah, so you see that from this schematic drawing, the uh, design of a lithium ion battery is really elegant. It has a cathode, it has an anode, everything is soaked in the liquid vessel. And as you charge and discharge, the lithium ion and electrons, they go through different pathways. One way or another, you are utilizing this uh, uh, mechanism to power the uh, external circuit or to store the energy. And that was the Nobel Prize in, 19, uh, in, in 2019, and it was uh, awarded to these three gentlemen here. Now, by looking at the breakdown of their contribution on the bottom, they actually tell us a lot about this industry. Stan, he was working on uh, titanium disulfide, this material. And he found out that this particular material really built this uh, framework at an atomic level so that it can intercalate with an ion. What does it mean? It means that at an atomic level, you build a room like this so that lithium ion, like every one of us, can go in and out without disrupting the structure. So that it's so stable, we can go in and out multiple times so that it becomes rechargeable. So that's the fundamental um, uh, principle led to the further direct developments in the field. John from UK Austin, he was working on solid um, metal oxide materials. And what he found out that is that uh, utilizing lithium cobalt oxide as a cathode material can improve the voltage from 2 volt to 4 volt. That dramatically increase the energy density so that your cell phone is no longer bulky. You can utilize a small device to store a sufficient amount of energy to serve the purpose of energy storage with good efficiency. Akira, this gentleman from Japan, what he did is that he replaced the lithium metal with carbon. And that's the final piece, make this commercially viable. Because lithium metal is so reactive, it's not safe. When you don't want to carry something in your pocket, that might catch fire. And graphite, on the other hand, it also facilitates this interpolation reaction. So that it's very stable and it's very cheap. That's why it's commercially viable. So you can see that starting from the concept, we improve the performance, we lower the cost, make it really viable as a product. So all of this, when we combine this together, it can create a picture. We make this to the Nobel Prize. It's easier said than done. If you look at what's inside the lithium battery, it's highly complicated. You have this jerry roll structure. If you zoom in, you look at many, many particles. Every particle is different. They have different size, they have different shape, they agglomerate together in different ways. If you follow Kali Oakland, you start to see grand boundaries, you start to see local phase transformations. So all of this makes it very difficult, very, very difficult to make a large format functional lithium ion battery that will perform very well. To make it even worse, the industry tend to change the cell format all the time. If you look at what happened on the top here, starting from the identical material, only if you change the form factor, there's a dramatic incentive, you can see here, to change the form factor. And if you look at what you have in your cell phone, a few years ago, you have two rectangular shaped cell, independent cell. And if you have that geometry, you can do a jelly roll, you can roll it together, you can squeeze it so that it's a, it's a rectangular shape. But today, if you look at what you have, you have something looking L-shaped. 
you come circle here, cut corner there, and when you have this shape, you can no longer go through the journey road. You have to go with a different manufacturing method, which is a stacking of the naturals. So that adds additional challenge to the system. So the manufacturing of battery is highly complicated. It has many steps, as I illustrated on the top here, and for each of these steps, you probably have 100 knobs to tune. Right? Many things can go wrong. What goes wrong? Why it goes wrong? What's the consequence? How do we mitigate? Those are very important questions for this field. So we are looking into this. We are looking into different steps of this manufacturing pipeline, and we try to understand it, try to improve it. Getting a state-of-the-art instrument is not, not the answer to this, because even if you do have a state-of-the-art instrument, if it's not tuned right, you can still end up with products with a lot of defects. And those defects are highly detrimental. You don't want that to go into your cell phone in the end. So that's why we are looking into this. It's highly interesting from both the academia and the industry perspective. And we realized that we need to combine different tools, for example, optical imaging, infrared imaging, X-ray imaging. We need to use these tools because they are sensitive to, to different types of defects. They can capture different um, imperfections in the system. They can provide some feedback, help us to improve this process. So we have been actively working on this field, and that gets us some exposure to start to engage with industry. And then our industry partners, told us that, why don't you look further? There are more important steps. For example, as I show on top here, there's this battery formation process, which is one of the major bottleneck in the process. If you look at this pipeline, upstream we're talking about high volume manufacturing, low growth processing. The process is creating so many battery cells per, per hour. Right? And then what happens is that you have to store all the batteries in a confined space under elevated temperature for hours and maybe days and weeks. And if you do that, that's what's going to happen. Moving on to that right hand side, I'll show you the consequence. So, can we make it faster? Can we make it safer? Not only for the uh, downstream operation, but also for the manufacturing process. Can we improve the manufacturing safety and also reduce the manufacturing cost? Those are important questions we are trying to address. So long story short, in this particular study, what we did is that we designed different formation protocols. Traditionally, what you do in the formation is that you make a battery. The first time you cycle it, you try to be very gentle. You run a very small current, you cycle it, you charge it on the order uh, on the order of 10 hours, or sometimes 20 hours, sometimes or even longer. And if you do it faster using a high current charging, you can see on the right hand side that this uh, baseline tool here, the capacity is just not good. But with some improvement of the protocol, we can not only make the uh, efficiency high, but also improve the performance on the right. So that really is the, uh, um, the goal of our research. We really want to address those challenges in this, in this field. Then our industry partners ask us, why don't you look even further upstream? For example, this electrical vacuum process is another limiting factor in the manufacturing pipeline here. So what you do is that you make a dry electrical, and then you inject some liquid into the cell. And after that, you wait for 30 hours, 40 hours, 36 hours, wait for the liquid to soak the electrical. Right? Some people suggest that maybe we can increase the temperature. If we do it at 45 degrees C instead of 25 degrees C, maybe it's beneficial, maybe it will be faster. And we utilize our tool to look at itself and we realize that it helps to a limited extent. So when we show this to, our, to my student, or my student, he said, wait a minute, this is not right. I uh, wash dishes at home all the time, right? I never wait for the liquid to soak my sponge. What I did is to squeeze it a few times. It will just wet my sponge instantaneously. So inspired by that, we develop a uh, pressure control system which press the cell release the pressure and then we do this iteratively. We can see that the wetting was accomplished in 60 minutes. So that increased the throat, that increased the efficiency. When we show this to our industry partners, they said, good job, but this only works for the pouch cell which has a soft case, right? 
for the cells that utilize the electrical vehicles, for example, the uh, cylindrical cells, or even larger cells, it has a, uh, a hard case. Right? The pressure is not going to work because when you squeeze on the 18650 cylindrical cell, you are not able to squeeze against the hard case. That's why um, you know, we keep getting questions, getting feedbacks from the industry. For example, as I said, Rivian and GM asked this question instantaneously. And some official look at this, they said, can we develop a you know, compact module that can be uh, you know, a, a, a integrated into a perpetual pipeline to really see this uh, in line, to really see this as the cells are being manufactured. So what I'm showing you, you here is that uh, um, the importance of really having a close interaction between the academia and industry so that we know what matters so that we can be aligned, we can work on challenges that are very difficult. So we are developing tools. You can see that we work with Rivian, we work with Theta Nanotech, we work with General Motors, some official is interested from a different perspective, and combined, we can make sure that the uh, academia research is really addressing the industry problems. Now, if there's a lack of this interaction, I'm going to show you another example here, which is interesting but not as effective. Okay. So this is interesting. This is one of these wireless earbuds, and I received it as a birthday gift a few years ago. And I only use my right hand side because of my personal habit. And after two years, three years, the right hand side complained about low battery over time, and the left hand side is still fine. So I told my student that this is your opportunity. Go figure out what went wrong. So, so he, he did a great job. He took the cell, he started his using all the instruments we have at Texas, uh, at, uh, Texas Materials uh, Institute, TMI, and we understand this and we figure out the um, uh, degradation in device. But when we finish that research, when we look at what's in the market, you can see that the, the design has already changed. <coughs> you see this thing? It's becoming smaller outside but larger inside because the cell is now integrated into the head over there. So you see that uh, you know this is a cute example. We do it for fun. That's what we usually do. But without a close interaction, the uh, um, impact is somewhat limited. So we really want to have a close engagement so that we can have a, a, you know, a more uh, effective uh, direction for the research. So finally, uh, because this is an um, uh, AI event, I want to highlight that uh, AI has been integrated in the research, in the efforts, and from my perspective, we have been using AI in several different uh, um, scenarios. For example, at upstream, we use AI to screen many different materials. We do a, a theory modeling. We um, figure out what are the um, viable uh, candidates and we test it through high throughput synthesis, high throughput characterization, and then it helps us to really narrow down the um, candidates. On the other hand, for the uh, processing optimization, as I mentioned, there are so many knobs that can be figured with, what can be um, really um, optimized, what can be um, uh, you know, uh, uh, integrated into a system to really improve the uh, uh, manufacturing throughput and also manufacturing safety, those are important questions we try to address. So finally, for the uh, large scale production, it's a very different uh, piece. Okay, when you are looking at large scale production, you want SOP, you want standardized uh, protocols, and uh, you don't want to change your protocol all the time. But on the other hand, you do want to integrate some tools, some sensors into the system, so that it will tell you if there's anything that's going wrong. So that will be a critical feedback, and it will be uh, utilized for optimization of this and for quality control and uh, for design control. So with that, I will stop. Uh, I thank you for your attention. I hope that uh, I show you the uh, um, the efforts in uh, doing battery research and uh, uh, <coughs> manufacturing. I hope I convince you that AI has a role to play, and we would like to integrate those developments and leverage all the efforts. Thank you.